the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines are a set of design rules to ensure that the web is usable by people with various disabilities. One of the guidelines intends to ensure that there's enough contrast between the text and the background so that most everyone can read it. The WCAG measures contrast as a ratio of the perceived brightness of the text to that of the background. The possible range is a number from 1 to 21, where 1 means no contrast at all, and 21 is the maximum contrast that can be displayed. The guideline sets minimum thresholds for various elements on the page, like headlines and the main body text, which we'll focus on. The absolute minimum contrast is 4.5, which is the AA level. For enhanced contrast, they require a minimum of 7, which is the enhanced AAA level. Let's see how this works. I'm not trying to single out Google by using the keyword blog in Chrome. These are just convenient examples. The issues we'll encounter are inherent in the design of the guideline, the rendering technology, and the aesthetic trends in web and UI design. Chrome has a built-in contrast checker. Like all the contrast checkers I've encountered, it digs into the DOM and style sheets to find the text and background colors and performs the WCAG calculations with those. In this case, we have a white background and dark gray text. From those values, Chrome reports that the contrast ratio is 16.09 for the body text of the article. That's well above even the AAA minimum contrast of 7, so we should be in good shape. But I think this text looks a little fuzzy, or thin, or washed out. Reading just a paragraph or two feels tedious. What's going on? Let's pull a screenshot into vCell, a spreadsheet that crunches images rather than numbers. The first column shows a scaled down copy of the screenshot. The next shows a sample of the body text at the rendered size. When we zoom in, we see that the text is not a solid color, but a variety of blends of the text and background colors. This is anti-aliasing, which makes the letters look smoother. Without it, the curves and diagonals would appear jagged. Anti-aliasing is low-pass filtering that trades off blurring for high spatial frequencies beyond that which the pixel grid can accurately represent. The slight blurring is more acceptable to our eyes than the jaggies. The colorful fringes seen here are from Microsoft's clear text, which is a form of anti-aliasing that also exploits the design of LCD displays to achieve sub-pixel rendering. Other systems may stick with shades of gray. To check the contrast, we start by converting all the pixels to grayscale values called luminance. Whether you start with colorful clear text or traditional anti-aliasing makes almost no difference once you've turned everything to grayscale. To compute the contrast ratio, we need to compare the luminance of the pixels that make up the text to those that make up the background. But exactly which pixels are text pixels? In this histogram, the leftmost column represents the number of pixels in our sample that are the color specified by the page design, in this case, Google Gray 900. The rightmost column is the number of pixels equal to the background color, pure white in this example. Note that the vertical scale is logarithmic. When the accessibility checker says the contrast ratio is 16, it's comparing these two extremes. But what about all the in-between values that result from anti-aliasing? Those pixels are blends of the desired color and the background color used to make the text look smoother. In theory, this should look great. The problem is that relatively few pixels are actually at the desired color. The characters are mostly made up of blended pixels. To the right, you can see a large blow up of the capital M. None of those pixels are the text color, though a few are pretty close. Two different sections of WCAG 2.1 explain how to measure the contrast ratio with some contradictory information. One note says the contrast ratio for text can be evaluated with anti-aliasing turned off, but few of today's browsers and operating systems still offer text without font smoothing. CSS layouts are now somewhat dependent on the ability to scale text linearly, which rules out font hinting and alternatives to anti-aliasing. Fortunately, the detailed WCAG 2.1 test procedure gives an alternative method for dealing with anti-aliasing. For anti-aliased letters, 
use the relative luminance value found two pixels in from the edge of the letter. The first source explains how to account for text outlines, halos, or shadows, which underscores the importance of the contrast at the edges of the characters. So rather than comparing the relative luminance of the text and background CSS colors, let's check the contrast at the edges of the characters as they are rendered. If we scan across a row of pixels, we want to use the second pixel in from the edge of a glyph. Unfortunately, with a thin stemmed font, the second pixel might already put us on the other side of the stroke, or at least close enough to the other side that we're on another blended pixel. So we'll instead use whichever of the first two pixels adjacent to an edge gives us the higher contrast value. We'll do this for every row of pixels in both directions, as well as for every column of pixels. If the horizontal and vertical passes give different results at a single position, we'll again choose whichever one represents the highest contrast. Here's the result of running this test on the sample we've been looking at. Blue represents an edge between the background and the character where the contrast ratio is at least 4.5, the AA level specified by WCAG 2.1. Green represents edges with a contrast of at least 7. That's the AAA level. Red represents edges where the contrast doesn't meet either guideline. Notice that the link text in the middle of our sample is unacceptably low contrast by any guideline. As we zoom in, we find a surprise. The lowercase f's at the right side of this view have mostly green outlines, but the one at the left has lower contrast edges. How can the same glyph rent be rendered with the same text color and end up with different contrast levels? That's an artifact of how anti-aliasing not only smooths the blocky appearance of the shapes, but also tries to approximate pixels that are positioned at fractional offsets with respect to the grid. In other words, anti-aliasing makes the simple approach of looking at the text color and the background color insufficient. Granted, this color-coded view isn't the best way to represent the results of the contrast. So let's illustrate this in a different way. In this last row, we have the contrast results thresholded based on a contrast ratio in the B column. At the AA 4.5 level, the sample is legible, except for the link text near the center. As we increase the threshold to the AAA 7 level, some of the characters start to disintegrate. Recall that the contrast checking tool we saw at the beginning claimed the contrast of this sample was a whopping 16.09. If we increase the threshold up to that, only tiny fragments of letters remain. And remember, our scanning algorithm always chose the most favorable value whenever there were different values for the different scanning directions. Our guideline says we have to meet or exceed a minimum contrast, but our tools only measure the highest contrast that might possibly occur. In practice, the overwhelming majority of edges are lower in contrast, sometimes much lower. If the fastest car on the highway is traveling faster than the speed limit, we cannot conclude that all of the traffic is speeding. Contrast checking tools overstate the contrast, sometimes by a huge amount. So it becomes entirely possible to deploy a low contrast design, believing that it meets the WCAG contrast test by a wide margin. Still not convinced? Here's the beginning of the article once again. With one small change to the style sheet, the body text can be transformed into this darker, crisper text. Here you can see both versions side by side. Which one would you rather read? Not just look at, but actually read. Note that I did not change the CSS colors. The crisper text is set to render at the same dark gray as the original text on the left. Since I haven't changed the text or background colors, the contrast checking tools all compute the same 16.09 to 1 ratio for both versions. So why does the text on the right look as if it has more contrast? It turns out that the style sheet for the keyword blog specifies a font weight of 300, which is one notch down from the default of 400. So instead of the Roboto typeface, it's rendered with Roboto Lite, which has thinner strokes. And that's the key. We can see how this plays out by comparing the two versions of the article in vCell. Column A is the original version with the font weight set to 300, 
and column B has the font weight set to 400. When we're zoomed in, we can see that, although the edges are still anti-aliased, the interior pixels of the heavier glyphs are indeed rendered at the target text color. Where the WCAG test procedure said to use the second pixel from the edge, they expected to find an interior pixel. But in the thin glyphs, there aren't any interior pixels. Unlike the histogram I showed earlier, these omit the background pixels. You're looking at just the pixels that make up the text. With the lighter font weight, only about 6.5% of the text pixels are set to the intended text color. With the heavier font, more than a quarter of the text pixels are the intended text color, and there are about 12% more text pixels overall. Let's see how this plays out for the contrast at the edges. Both are legible at the 4.5 level. At 7, they're pretty similar. If we jump to 10, the thin glyphs start to lose important detail, but the heavier ones are proving to be more robust. At 16, we know the thin glyphs are a lost cause. Although the heavier ones don't look great, you probably could make out most of the words. The WCAG rationale for the contrast guidelines mentions the possibility that larger sizes or higher contrast ratios may be necessary for very thin fonts. It's important to consider when the contrast thresholds may not be applicable. In a future presentation, I plan to explore why contrast is important not only for people with visual challenges, but for ease of reading by users with typical visual acuity.